Hello everyone, I'm Danny Roddy of DannyRoddy.com and I just put up a new article on my web blog entitled The Mysterious Conductor of the Hair Cycle Clock and I'm about to read it to you. So sit back and enjoy. One of the oldest explanations for baldness in the Western world was the exhaustion of nervous energy. That is the health and capability of the nervous system. In the 1881 book, American Nervousness, George W. Beard explains that baldness and many other problems increase at the expense of nervous energy due to the stress and strain of modern life. He says, The increasing popularity of baldness is one of the minor but most instructive expressions of nerve sensitiveness. Among savages in all parts of the earth, baldness is unusual, except in extreme age and gray hairs come much later than with us. So common is male baldness in our large cities that what was once a deformity and exception is now almost the rule and an element of beauty. One may be bald without being very nervous, but the general prevalence of baldness comes from the general prevalence of nervousness. George Beard called the exhaustion of nervous energy neurosothenia, and in many ways, the theory was the intellectual stepchild to Hans Selye's 1936 work on metabolic stress. In Beard's view, the person's unfavorable environment caused pattern baldness. Complementing Beard's environmental view of hair loss was the observation that baldness was noted less often among those engaged in manual labor and more frequently among scientists, academics, ministers, lawyers, and legislators. To advocates of the time, this suggested that simple living was hair protective and that brainy types were more likely to go bald. According to an advocate of the theory, if one wanted to keep their hair, they should avoid all excesses or extraordinary excitement and shun mental and body overstimulation and endeavor to preserve an equable temperament of mind and body. The dominant view of the time that something in the environment caused baldness shifted after James Hamilton's 1942 pioneering experiments with baldness immune eunuchs and castrates. Turning the attention to hormones and signaling substances in pattern baldness, Hamilton's work formed the foundation of what we know today as the androgen genetic alopecia or male pattern baldness. However, seven decades later, the androgen centric model of baldness has yielded unrewarding results and most importantly has failed to clarify the mysterious conductor of the long studied but poorly understood hair cycle clock. Part one, the missing conductor. In 2004, Paws et al. explored the dizzying array of growth promoters and inhibitors guiding the telogen, antigen, and catagen phases of the hair cycle. While hair research has come a long way from Hamilton's experiments with castrates, the group acknowledged the limitations of their research. They said, Together with numerous colleagues around the world, we have steadily contributed throughout the past decade to the quest to identify even more instruments in the hair cycle orchestra. However, we, and as far as one can tell from the published literature, everyone else, have clearly failed to identify the conductor. The above admission of failure hurts even more since not long ago, we were innocently hopeful to have had it all figured out. The paper concluded with a call for creativity and competition urging future researchers to explore theoretical frameworks that help direct hair cycle research off the beaten track and away from the mainstream. They said, even though this seems wildly unpopular today, especially with molecular biologists investigating the controls of hair follicle cycling, what we need more than anything else is more creativity and competition in terms of theory building about the hair cycle clock. Whether you like this or not, our experimental designs, consciously or unknowingly, are guided and misguided anyway by preconceived notions. Thus, we might as well spend more time with design and public debate of comprehensive theoretical frameworks that help to direct our future experimental strategies and that may lead us off the beaten track of mainstream hair cycle research. Rather than starting with the mind-bogglingly large and ever-growing number of regulatory signals currently implicated in hair cycle control, it might be more productive to inspect the macro events occurring in the balding individual in an attempt to avoid seeping into the abyss of overcomplexity. For instance, this year it was noted that balding males 18 to 35 years old were found to have increased adrenal production of DHEA, which was significantly associated with increased clinical severity 
of male pattern androgenic alopecia. Moreover, the group had a mean thyroid stimulating hormone level of 2.5, suggesting a higher functioning pituitary and enhanced cortisol secretion. Another study performed this year also found increased levels of DHEA in those with premature baldness in addition to higher levels of prolactin and a lower sex hormone binding globulin, or SHBG, which is a common feature of baldness. A higher functioning of the adrenal glands and pituitary involve changes in the stress response modulators, the mitochondria. Inhibiting mitochondrial energy production increases the reliance on pituitary and adrenal hormones such as cortisol, prolactin, DHEA, and aldosterone, which are all associated with baldness in both sexes. Moreover, these hormonal changes shift the balance between insulin-like growth factor 1, or IGF-1, and transforming growth factor beta-1, or TGF-B1, two growth factors that appear to be intimately involved in hair growth, as well as provide clues for identifying the missing conductor of the hair cycle clock. Part 2, IGF-1 and TGF-B1. The energy-hungry mini-organ, the hair follicle, normally engages in violent proliferative activity requiring safeguards for protection from free radical damage or oxidative stress. Similar to active thyroid hormone, saturated fats, sugars, and insulin, IGF-1 appears to increase the activity of the rate-limiting glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase enzyme, or G6-PDH, that produces NADPH to protect the hair follicle during its volatile growth phase. Polyunsaturated fats, hypothyroidism, and aldosterone, which is increased in males and females with pattern baldness and is stimulated by low thyroid function and prolactin, inhibits G6PDH and the production of NADPH. A deficiency of G6PDH and an excess of aldosterone leads to unmitigated oxidative stress, tissue injury, and an increase in the inflammatory cytokine TGF-B1. TGFB1 stimulates the formation of collagen, and over time, this production leads to parafollicular fibrosis, further reducing the hair follicle's access to oxygen, sugar, and other nutrients. Levels of TGFB1 are closely related to the progression of pattern baldness, and alongside hypoxia, the accumulation and activation of mast cells and an increased concentration of prostaglandins reinforce the view that the defining feature of pattern baldness, a decreased antigen to telogen ratio, is the result of chronic scalp inflammation and an inability to repair. The development of fibrosis and baldness might explain why accidentally setting fire to one's scalp can result in a new head of hair. TGF-B1 appears to share an inverse relationship with the liver's production of IGF-1, and in one experiment, supplementary IGF-1 stimulated hair follicle development, leading the researchers to say that it might be a promising drug candidate for baldness therapy. In the 1990s, Keely et al. demonstrated that IGF-1 inhibits the catagen and telogen phases of the hair growth cycle, favoring antigen. More recently, it was discovered that balding hair follicles secreted significantly less IGF-1, and that the down-regulation of IGF-1 may be one of the important mechanisms contributing to male pattern baldness. Progesterone is generally supportive of hair growth and has been shown to increase IGF-1 and lower aldosterone. The historical treatments for pattern baldness, ciproterone acetate and spironolactone, are both progesterone-like, and spironolactone has been shown to decrease TGF-B1. Finasteride has been shown to lower TGFB1, although long-term treatment might have the opposite effect. Working in the opposite direction of the most powerful antifibromatogenic steroid progesterone, estrogen appears to lower IGF-1 and increase aldosterone and TGFB1. IGF-1 may have other beneficial effects in baldness, including lowering SHBG and prolactin, various problems associated with baldness, including metabolic syndrome, heart disease, premature aging, depression and anxiety also appear to be helped by increasing IGF-1 levels. According to a 2012 paper, IGF-1 treatment has never been related to oncogenesis. Part 3. Identifying the Conductor The enormous, often redundant number of regulatory factors involved in hair cycle control is intimidating. However, IGF-1 and TGF-B1 appear to be near the top of the list. In keeping with a focus on what's occurring in the balding individual, I think mitochondrial respiration, guided by active thyroid hormone, is a candidate for the missing conductor of the hair cycle clock. First and foremost, active thyroid hormone is required for the health and vitality of the mitochondria, 
which limits the activity of the pituitary and adrenal systems that interfere with the hair growth cycle. Moreover, hair follicles are direct targets and sources of thyroid hormones, the general function of which appears to be to stimulate hair growth by prolonging the androgen growth phase. A deficiency of thyroid negatively influences the liver, sometimes leading to the development of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. In liver disease, IGF-1 levels are decreased and circulating levels correlate to the extent of liver dysfunction. A supplement of thyroid has been shown to restore levels of IGF-1. In addition to being the main source of IGF-1, the liver is where the metabolism of inactive thyroid hormone T4 into active thyroid hormone T3 primarily occurs. In stress, serum levels of T3 tend to decline, with the majority of T4 being metabolized into the antithyroid substance reverse T3. While the situation is far from clear, in one experiment it was found that the level of reverse T3 rose in parallel with the TGFB1 level. In the heart, T3 has been shown to reverse fibrosis. Hair follicles represent one of the most hormone-sensitive tissues in the human body and are exquisitely thyroid hormone-sensitive. While hair follicles appear to be somewhat resistant to shifts in energy due to their massive glycogen stores, I think a chronic deficiency of thyroid explains the high rate of pattern baldness that both men and women experience during a lifetime. An explanation for the degree of baldness probably depends on an organism's available resources and unique ability to adapt to early life stress. For example, in chimps, food scarcity leads to a hypersensitivity to both TGFB1 and cortisol. Part 4. Do no harm. Besides increasing thyroid function and keeping the polyunsaturated fats relatively low, sufficient dietary protein is a large variable in the liver's production of IGF-1. Compared to other proteins, milk was found to have a proportionately greater influence on IGF-1 levels. If milk digestion has worsened with age, i.e. diarrhea, gas, etc., a bacterial overgrowth could be involved and can sometimes be resolved with antibiotics. The amino acid glycine found in gelatinous cuts of meat like oxtail and lamb shank has many anti-inflammatory and antifibrotic properties. Similarly, aspirin is a safe anti-inflammatory that's found to reverse fibrosis possibly by interfering with the metabolism of arachidonic acid. Malnutrition is associated with reduced IGF-1 levels, suggesting the use of nutritious foods like eggs, ruminant liver, and oysters regularly. Fasting, a practice that has radically increased in popularity over the last few years, decreases IGF-1 and can lead to a hypothyroid-like state. Similarly, very low carbohydrate or ketogenic diets have been found to reduce IGF-1. Homemade marmalade, sweet orange juice, and guava are sources of the chemicals apigenin and naringenin which help reduce TGFB1, protect against fibrosis, and in the case of apigenin, may promote hair growth. Adequate salt in the diet has been found to restrain the release of excess aldosterone. An article in 2005 found that the requirement of salt to retain magnesium and calcium was 230% higher than the recommended dietary allowance. In my own research, people with pattern baldness very often have deficiencies of vitamin D. The amount of vitamin D in the blood influences the concentration of IGF-1 and TGFB-1. Besides getting adequate calcium and keeping phosphate relatively low, chronometer.com can be used to estimate the content of phosphate and calcium in the diet. In my limited experience, I found a supplement of vitamin D to be useful. In the interest of avoiding excessive complexity and possible intestinal allergens, it might be best to use a vitamin D3, along with the other fat-soluble vitamins, in oil applied to the skin rather than orally. According to Raymond Peet, about one-third or one-fifth is absorbed topically compared to an oral dose. For myself, I've found that applying the vitamins to a lower leg and wrapping it in a thin, loose layer of plastic wrap is a smooth way of avoiding the vitamins rubbing off on my pants. Wearing long socks can be helpful, too. Thank you so much for listening to me read my brand new article. So if you wanted to check out the references, go to dannyrowdy.com and search for Mysterious Conductor of the Hair Cycle Clock. Click on that article and you can see all the references. I think there's like 82 of them. So check that out. Hit that like button if you're on Facebook. That always supports the content and I sincerely appreciate it. I'll be hanging around in the comments on Facebook or YouTube, so feel free to ask any questions. And thank you so much. I have an amazing viewership. I know I always say that, but it's true. And I just get uh, remarkably positive comments all the time. So thank you very much. I'll talk to you guys soon and take care.